OK, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the uh, organizer of SBAR to give me this opportunity and uh, to speak with the uh, esteemed audience. So what I'm going to do for the next 40 minutes and I understand I have one hour, 40 minutes of speech and 20 minutes of uh, Q&A. I'm going to share with you and what is a uh, blockchain technology and also before that, that's a fractional equity sharing concept, uh, how it is made simpler and possible by the blockchain technology. And I understand the audience may not be uh, typically very technical, so I'll try to keep the topic uh, a little bit general. And uh, I will also use three of the examples to illustrate the uh, blockchain application concepts. So a little bit about myself and uh, I have been a career banker and uh, first of all, you know, out of business school and on Wall Street, I started with Morgan Stanley and Chemical Bank Equitable Life from an investment banker to uh, the uh, derivative traders. So led a quite successful career in the um, investment banking and uh, capital markets area. So I was transplanted from New York to Singapore and uh, I ran, built and ran the derivative industry basically in Asia. And uh, subsequently in Hong Kong with Chase. So we saw that corporate career, then uh, I left and uh, to start some of the entrepreneurial venture back in Singapore. So even though, you know, I've had a career always as a major and the um, senior investment banker, but I always have, um, you know, pension for entrepreneurial ventures. And uh, even if I remember back in uh, 1994, when we first started the uh, uh, risk management consultancy and subsequently the banking system company. And uh, our company was the first one to have the email address on everybody's business card. And I still remember the days when people first look at the uh, business card. They always question, uh, what is that? You know, that email address. <laughs> so also in the very beginning, we are always trying to pioneer in the technology business. Our company's website and uh, for the Singapore company is called Advanced Risk Management Solutions. And uh, the website arms.com.sg has been ranked as the number one finance related websites by IBM in the earlier stage of the internet. So that was a good old days. And then the, since then, we've been involved in many, many technology uh, company and uh, always trying to try out all the new idea. So currently, and we have about three uh, technology venture related to blockchain. And some of them actually had an earlier fractional share, you know, and uh, the basically trying to securitize the uh, ownership and I will explain to you how is that related to the blockchain tokenization. So first of all, what is blockchain? Blockchain is basically a decentralized database technology. And most people are familiar with what the database is, you know, in your company and uh, in your office. From the earlier days of Microsoft Access to Oracle database, and then Sybase, you know, MongoDB, and also nowadays you have um, the uh, MySQL. So these are actually centrally located and centrally managed by the corporation. That's, that's why it's called a centralized management. What is the main breakthrough for blockchain? It's basically this database is no longer located centrally and managed by a few individuals in the corporation. So this database could be spread all over the world in 20 nodes, 200 nodes, 2,000, 20,000, or 200,000 nodes around the world. All these computers, you know, in their CPU, they have a copy of this data. Now, anybody who want to make a changes to this data, you need to get the 51% consensus of all the different nodes before you can make changes to this data. That's really what it is. That's really what the blockchain represents, a decentralized ledger technology or distributed ledger technology. Now, why is that so important? Because in the past, 
all the data, you know, in, in the electronic format. Or before you even have internet in the electronic format, you have physical format. It's all controlled by an individual within the corporation. So this person can change the data anytime he wants. So how can you actually trust this person not to alter the data for his own advantage? Now, all of a sudden, you've got a decentralized decision making and you need to get a consensus before you can make any changes. That really transformed the world in terms of business transactions. One of the best application is basically to apply to money, to currencies. So let's take a look at it. Why is that so important? Why? Because of the blockchain. And nowadays we have Bitcoins, we have altcoins, you know, and stable coin. Pretty soon we're going to have a central central bank digital currency. In fact, the Chinese central bank already has the uh, digital renminbi. They have already done more than 300 million. They are sort of the pioneer to really test out this concept. And of course, you have a few other countries, you know, Marshall Island and uh, in the Bahamas, they have a cent dollars, but uh, none of them so far is as significant, of course, as the big, second biggest economy in the world. So that's the uh, digital currency. Now, before we get deeper into the cryptocurrency, let's review a little bit about the um, theories for money. Now, in the old days, people basically using any physical item, such as a seashell, such as a metal, could be silver, could be gold, or in the old days, people use the salt, you know, any mine or spices, and uh, or even using beads as a currency. As long as you can satisfy this as a medium of exchange, or you know you can count them, and uh, if you put your whatever the the value into it, you got that you have to get this currency to be able to to hold the value. Then later on, people realize maybe we don't need a physical item. If somebody write an IOU, you know, a debt, if we can tokenize that debt. As long as people accept it, we can use that as a currency. OK. So first of all, then you can understand these are all the criteria and uh, in order for you to have a currency. So for example, if you go to a club mat, you know, in the 80, 90s, that was very popular and they take away all your belongings, all your real cash, you know, they give you beats. With that beats, you can actually buy beer, buy drinks, and then uh, they will actually, actually let you play games. If you play games, you win a prize. They give you more beats. So that's a form of currency within um, isolated community. So then came Bitcoin in 2009. So most people are familiar with the uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper. First of all, you know, he want to create, because of the internet, an electronic version of money. So if it is the electronic version of the money, you actually have to have uh, a, a couple criteria to fit in as a money, right? And uh, you can have a medium exchange, uni of account, but the traditionally you have the other characters such as a durability, fungibility. And what do they mean? Durability meaning, you know, you have a seashell, you have a gold coin, so it's not going to be destroyed e uh, easily. Fungibility, that could be the same seashell, you know, even though it's kind of dirty, a little bit broken on the edges, but you can still use that to exchange for the same value. Or if you nowadays have a dollar bill, you know, one dollar bill is very dirty, the other one is very clean, but they can still, you know, be interchangeable. Then divisibility, which means all your currency, you have to be able to de uh, divide them into cents, you know, or add them up. And uh, cognize, cognizability, most people at the side of it, they know what it is, you know. And portability, you can carry it with you. Then the next character is actually very important. It has to have the scarcity value. It cannot be unlimited supply. Therefore, traditionally, if people use a physical item as, a, as money, that created a lot of problem. Because let's say in some community you use a seashell, all of a sudden, you know, the wave and bring to a lot of new seashell to the to the sand, to the sand beach. 
or somebody discover another salt mine, that will totally disrupt the whole money supply and make some of those people who discover them, you know, filthy rich. So these are the criteria. Now, what is Bitcoin then? And how does it relate to the blockchain technology? Okay, so let's take a look at the different type of money that's available. I have described the commodity money using a physical item. Now, then some people say, well, maybe that's too heavy to bring a gold coin, you know, with your whole pocket with a big coin. Why don't we just use a, a paper to represent how much money that we hold? This is actually the US dollar or the major currency for the European countries. And from 1944, and based on the Bretton Woods system, everybody agreed to pack the US dollar at $35 per ounce. So that period is called the uh, gold standard. That represented the money of a tokenized money. Then in 1971, and uh, the President Richard Nixon at the stroke of a pen and to abolish that gold standard. Since 1973, the US dollar being free floating, and that is called a fiat money. What is a fiat money? Fiat money is basically, I'm the sovereignty, I'm the government, and uh, I give you the coin, give you the paper notes as a legal tender, and uh, they have value because I say so. <laughs> so that's called a fiat concept. Now, if you look into more theory, I know we don't have time to talk about all this, and it's basically the difference between a chartalism versus a metalism. You know, whether you have something physical or something you don't need it, it's just the word of the government. The other two type of money is a fiduciary money, and it doesn't have to be a government. It could be like a Medici bank in the old days, or somebody write a check, you know, and then you endorse it, you can pass on to somebody else. That is another form of money. The last type is actually very interesting. That's called a bank money. That's basically the bank's ledger. So again, this part of it, there's a lot of research for those who are in interested in this field, and uh, I encourage you to Google it, to uh, read up. That bank money is basically the money creation and what the government uses as a money supply to control the monetary policy. And uh, somebody, let's say with $100 depositing one bank, then the bank keep, uh, the bank can keep $10, $10 and then the lend out and lend out the $90 to another bank. Another bank keep another 10% and lend out to another bank. And hence, you know, you create a lot of new money. But the fact what it relates to Bitcoin is all these money has no physical item, it's just in the ledger of the bank. All right. That's what Bitcoin copies. Because right now, all of a sudden, previously, the bank has a database. As I said, it's centralized. It's managed by the bank employee. They make their own decision. All of a sudden, that database is distributed all over the world in different nodes. So that's what Bitcoin is. That's basically a trustless public ledger. Why is that important? Not only at the moment you mine it, you create it, you have a record. Okay, and uh, who owns that? Right, and uh, the Bitcoin creator make people to do work. They let your computer using your CPU power to do the proof of work to solve a puzzle. Once you successfully solve the puzzle, the additional Bitcoin you mine belong to you. Then you need a public ledger. Everybody has to agree, at least 51% consensus. This person owns that new Bitcoin, okay? Now, the second major question is, how do you use it? How do you circulate it, right? If you have a physical money, you give it away. And nowadays in the cryptocurrency, we call it an airdrop. And, uh, or you can actually let people do work, just like for Bitcoin, let uh, all the other nodes with your computer CPU power to solve a puzzle. That's how you encourage the circulation. Now, the second most important point is when you spend it, how do you keep track of it? So therefore, the because the Bitcoin is electronic money and it's sort of similar to a computer file, but what is different from a computer file is if you want to spend it, you send it to somebody else. The big, big question is how do you know this person is not going to make a copy and send it to somebody else to spend it again? <laughs> That's the genius invention of Satoshi Nakamoto. So he created this blockchain concept 
then you need uh, 51 consensus to make sure this person can only spend that Bitcoin once, and that's it. So from that 2009, that introduced this new revolution of a blockchain. Subsequently, other than the Bitcoin, most people know you have a lot of altcoin that in 2017, from 1617, that's a peak of the ICO. Nowadays, I will not go into some of the too much of the detail for the, the limitation of time. Uh, nowadays, you know, it evolved into a stable coin. What stable coin is, is basically just packed into the uh, conventional fiat currency. So let's say the Tether, the USTD, that's packed to the US dollar. Therefore, the stable coin's value is really just take advantage of the technology. However, it doesn't have the monetary aspect of it because it's fully packed. Whatever US dollar depreciate or appreciate against other currency, so does a stable coin. That turned out to be the most popular. However, if you look at stable coin, right now it's in the private hands. That's basically what the central bank first has to duplicate to create the central bank digital currency. But of course, the central bank has more concern. You know, the European Central Bank or the US Federal Reserve, they want to make sure once they issue this, take the genius out of the bottle, they can control it, you know, to continue to conduct the monetary policy. I also need to mention, you know, all these innovations didn't really solve the long term solution for a best currency. And uh, I myself, I will explain more in the next slides and created a concept called uh, TARELF, which stands for Total Aggregate Real Estate and Land Value for a Sovereign Entity, which means, and instead of gold standard, you know, again, on that block site, you can see a lot of these uh, explanation from an academic standpoint. And uh, the TARELF has a lot of advantage over the traditional gold standard because gold, you can actually uh, rob it, you know, steal it. Gold, because of the fact it's portable, it creates a lot of wars, but nobody can rob your islands away, you know, in your country. So that's why real estate at the end of the day, which is really the best commodity to back up your fiat money. So that would be the best form of a representative money. OK. Lastly, in this section, I would just mention a little bit about the non fungible token, which is also something new. And what it is, is actually evolved into uh, uh, from the video gaming, like the previous speaker talking about gaming, e-sports e and all that. So if you can have a reward token within those application, that turned out to be a collectible or somebody just create some electronic art image, they can actually subdivide it because they created it electronically. It's much easier to tokenize. Then people claim this has value. So what is the future application? You can link up to the physical world, to the artworks, or some people trying to link up to the real estate. Now, that's another whole different discussion talking about the securitization aspect of a digital currency. But basically, what I want to mention and uh, one of the most important concepts is people basically just create some new NFT just the same way in the old world people create create a painting. Then they say, oh, it has value, you know, like a Mark Roscoe. It's cost 50 million for a simple painting, a few colors. So that's kind of a little bit um, uh, dangerous. However, that's really where the human society has been, you know, people just putting a value that's created an asset bubble and created a, you know, when the bubble burst and uh, they created a lot of financial distress for the society. And very briefly to the next two concepts, it's called DeFi and which is the hardest area is decentralized finance. And uh, previously people just quite satisfied just owning the Bitcoin for the, uh, the uh, appreciation. But nowadays, you know, because of a lot of a stable coin, then uh, people say, I'm putting my money there. I'm not earning interest, you know, then again, whenever there's demand, there's innovation and people create a way to create a yield or interest for those, the, uh, uh, the cryptocurrencies. And so far, the majority of them is based on the ERC20 token on the Ethereum. And uh, again, this is a whole big new field and um, it's hard to conclude now, especially in the yield farming. 
and uh, it's actually quite um, dangerous. You know, if you say the ICO lasted for a couple of years, right now people see the negative consequence of those ICO sponsor when the regulator, you know, and all of a sudden they uh, get to them now. But yield farming, that's just starting from, you know, within the, uh, a year or so. And there's a lot of high flyer, then so there's extreme volatility. People made quick money and lost a lot of money. Basically, I just want to mention one academic concept. How do you create a yield? Because in the traditional money, let's say a bank lends you a money. Let's say in the old days, you know, somebody want to borrow the money and build some ship from Europe and go to Southeast Asia to bring by some spice and they can sell it, you know, five times, 10 times higher price. They are still providing value by lending. But in the cryptocurrency, so far you don't have that opportunity to create value. The way they create value is by staking. And uh, this is talking a little bit deeper in terms of the technology behind it. The Bitcoin is still asking people to do work in order to mine more new Bitcoin. But in many other currencies, they basically are saying proof of stake, how much money you have. Therefore, if you lend your cryptocurrency to somebody else, they can put it together to create new the, uh, the tokens. That's called a liquidity mining. Anyway, with this as a background, I hope uh, it's quite general and uh, at least I give you a good understanding to uh, for the next stage. I want to use some example. How can we use those concepts to go to the next stage? Now, before I get there, I want to mention a little bit on my personal journey. I've been involved and uh, since the days I was a banker, then I retired from that. I've been involved in a lot of tech ventures. And as a derivative trader within the bank, you know, our job within the bank or structured derivatives banker, we create new financial instruments. Then you create a capital market for it. So we repeated that over and over again. You were basically just a financial innovator within the bank. So when I left the bank, you know, I continue on in that trend. So I brought that expertise to the real estate market. So way back in the beginning, we created the uh, predecessor for the index future and option exchanges on real estate. That ended up eventually in the CME, traded a future and option contract. So then in the second stage, I was called back and, uh, to China. I was the first foreigner to work on the communist owned bank in 2005. And uh, we created an interest rate swap. I will explain to you in the next slide. So when I came back, then we focus on an OTC version of the uh, real estate. That's called a swap rent. Again, on the, the block site, there's a lot of uh, information there. What is most significant, I want to spend a little bit of time explaining, that's a FAJO and uh, related to that, that's a Tarot. So here is what I did in the um, uh, future and option exchange on the real estate indices. So then I went back to Beijing and uh, I was the chief investment officer and um, the number three person, you know, in the fifth largest bank in China. We created a miracle, did the first interest we swapped. Before we arrived, the Chinese, you know, corporation individual, they couldn't control their interest rate risk because all the loan is a central planning communist. So whoever needs money, central bank gives them money to the state owned company. Then you build bridges and highway. How do you pay back? one year deposit rate, so it floats every year. What we did that's so revolutionary with my team, we introduced the 10 billion first ever interbank interest rate swap fixed versus floating. Because of that, that bank became the first commercial bank to offer long-term fixed rate mortgages. So that totally changed the Chinese financial, the history of the Chinese financial market. When I came back in 2005, I took that original real estate derivative into an OTC version that's called swap rent. And there's a lot of literature on the internet. And the subsequently I created that FAJO concept. I, this is actually in the CPI financial, and uh, that's a perfect fit for the Islamic finance. And let me explain to you why. What FAJO is, and uh, it's basically a flexible reversible joint home ownership. So instead of buying a single family home or a condo using down payment and a mortgage, you can actually put together, let's say four person or 10 person together. Everybody come to the table with cash. 
then you form a company, a business legal enti entity in any country. In the U.S., let's say the most convenient is LLC. Use LLC to buy that one home at a time, one single family home at a time. So let's say four person, each person owns a quarter of them. Now, one person decide to be the tenant for this house. So therefore, he make monthly payment. He himself is also a co-investor. Co each quarter of the monthly payment goes into each one of the four investors that owns this house. This is a simple concept. Took me a long time to throw away the derivatives. It's way too complicated for the consumers to move on to this equity sharing concept. What is the significance? Number one, the property will never have a, a mortgage or to be used as a collateral for a loan. If you do that, you will get foreclosed. That's what created the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. So at the peak of the market, I was brought to uh, Washington, D.C. together with Chris Lawson, the guy who started the Prosper.com. Now he, he bought over the Ripple, the cryptocurrency, and uh, he had that P2P lending concept. I had my swap rate and uh, Fajo, we presented it to the you know conference uh, that included the, uh, um, uh, for example, Mark Calabria, which now is the director of uh, Federal Housing Finance Agency, he used to be the chief of staff of the Senate Banking Committee. Basically, at the time, U.S. has a financial crisis, and uh, they were trying to find out what are the solution can solve it. But unfortunately, and uh, as usually happened, Wall Street during that time, they sort of screwed up the whole world, and uh, they lost the credibility to launch a new innovation. So in any case, that was the peak of the time. I also presented the idea to ERTI, the Islamic Research and Training Institute of the Islamic Development Bank back in 2009. And um, so again, during that peak of period, I spent a lot of time introducing that whole academic concept. But I will mention about the execution part. And before that, let me just to mention again, what is the advantage or value of a FAGIO? First of all, you can understand, no more mortgage. The property will never get ex exposed, but you cannot prevent people from borrowing money to have a leverage return. So therefore, one of the four people, if you want to use a leverage to have increased return, so let's say, you know, um, a, a Jewish person, you know, a probably good at finance, you want to borrow money. Before you come to the table, you borrow money for your quarter stake inside the single family home. If you cannot service that debt, you get foreclosed of your 20% stake only but the three other investors will not be affected. You see, you can isolate the leveraging down to the individual level. So why is that important for the Islamic finance? Because in the Sharia law, you know, and uh, they sort of have uh, this concept, the Reba concept, right? So again, I encourage you, if you're interested in this topic, because I spent a lot of time, at least 10 years of my time into this, I encourage you to take a look at the, uh, um, there is a lot of information, including a, a short video, the uh, video clip about that. Okay. So the, the because of the FAGIO, we for the first time we get to quantify the real estate, right? If you can actually have fractional share. Of the of the ownership of a real estate, all of a sudden, from single family home to hotel to uh, you know any office building, commercial property, then you can quantify the entire real estate holding of a country. Therefore, I came up with the idea of the TARREL. If a country can actually quantify and uh, all their real estate holding, then you can use the entire country's real estate and land value to back up your currency. Again, there's a lot of academic discussion why it's that more superior. But to use real estate to back up a currency is nothing new. For example, in France, way back in 1796, they got Asina mandat. They already, you know, the French, French government need to borrow money to finance the American Revolution, and it didn't work. Then in 1924, after World War I, Germany also tried using real estate to back up their own sovereign currency, you know, fiat currency. So it's called Rentenmark. Both of these failed. Why did they fail? Because there's no technology. 
you cannot quantify the real estate. How do you tell, you know, how does the real estate value go up and down, you know? So nowadays, again, we said the quantification technology, especially now with that blockchain, that could make this possible now for the first time, okay? So again, in 2008, 2011, I spent a lot of time on this. You see, when it comes to execution, what can we do to make it happen? That one single family home, I got equity investor. There's no mortgage, no loan. So it's basically just trying to securitize a single family home. Everybody own a stock in a company. Basically, we're trading each condo, each home, one home at a time as a company to so own the share in it. There's no lending concept. So it's perfect, you know, regarding complying to RIBA. So the only way during that time under the existing legal infrastructure, that's called securitization. What is the problem? You have no trading liquidity. Secondly, after financial crisis, we're trying to launch it back then, 2011, 2013, and um, people are scared about single family home because of Wall Street, you know, made a whole mess of the world. Nobody want to invest in single family home. Lo and behold, in 2017, with the ICO, initial coin offering. For those of you who are unfamiliar with what happened into the tokenization, blockchain or cryptocurrency and ICO, what ICO is, is the initial coin offering. Instead of offering a stock, anybody with a good business idea, you don't have to have a product, you don't have to have a business. You can go to the token world, you know, token market, and try to raise 50, 60 million. You see a lot of uh, young programmers from Ukraine, from Russia, you know, and young kids with no legal knowledge, banking or, or you know, the legal knowledge, all of a sudden they own a token and then raise 50, 60 million dollars. So that's what the whole market went wild. Why did it happen? Because during that time, there were almost 600 billion of cryptocurrency holder. The majority of them in Bitcoin and Ethereum and Ethers. So they were looking for alternative coin. That's why it's called altcoin to investing. So that period just went wild. And then um, being a seasoned, you know, a licensed investment banker, we were a little cautious. We got caught into that wave as well. Now, very quickly to the next concept, okay. In st the fourth stage, we extended that whole concept into yacht, fractional share owning. So why does it make sense? You know, anybody, let's say you buy $10 million a yacht, or you can buy a half a million, a boat. You don't use that boat or yacht whole year long. Why don't you have four person owning a yacht? Each person using three months of the year, you know, and that make perfect sense. In fact, without the currency world, blockchain, people are already doing that. You know, that's called a fractional share co-ownership, but it's very difficult. It's the same problem with the old, without the technology. But nowadays, again, with the tokenization, you, you make the fractional share co-ownership much easier, you know? So, Eventually, in 2016, we consolidated all these fractional share of real estate to own a vacation home and fractional share of uh, a yachts or artwork and into we co own. And uh, that's what we end up with this current venture of a we co own and uh, we property owner. Basically, eventually, after 15 years, what it boils down to, let's say we can create a platform for any potential buyer, if you don't happen to have a family or friends with cash to buy the things with you, and then you don't want to be burdened alone by a 90% LTV, the large loan amount, and then get foreclosed you know, later on, you can actually just come to the website and then uh, post a picture to say, hey, this is a vacation home I want to buy. This is a painting I want to buy. This is a yacht I want to buy. This is a jet, an airplane I want to buy. Who wants to join me? That's it, very simple concept. Therefore, people take a look at it, they say, oh, I, I love it, I'll join you. Again, so that's equity sharing being facilitated much easier than before now. We created a companion site, it's called We Property Owner. Because of the enhanced buying power, it's not just one person anymore. Whatever item, hotel you wanna sell, office building you wanna sell, your single family home you wanna sell, yachts you wanna sell, your horses, race horses you want to sell. Now, with the potential buyers, a group of people instead of one individual, your buying power is much higher. Therefore, the seller would be much more willing to list 
on the website. Again, all these services are free, and uh, I want to just show you quickly. This is with the uh, WeCo own. Then, as you can see, and uh, this is a We Property owner, so it's interrelated as one of the same free platform. Anybody can be a member for free. So, how does it relate to blockchain? First of all, all the transaction is irreversible. In the blockchain lingo, they, they call it immutable. Right, and uh, you can actually get everything online. Your transaction being done, and there's a property management system, and everything online. You cannot renege your purchase and sell. So this is the first step. And second step, you can also introduce a cryptocurrency. You know, and uh, whoever purchased a property, you can give them a rewards. That's called a utility token. So many many application can make this traditional simple concept which I worked on for 15 years, all of a sudden because of this technology, the, it, they get turbocharged. So now for the remaining time, I want to mention a little bit about the mu chain and turbo chain, the, the next two you know, application of a blockchain. As you can see, I spent a lot of time in the fractional share concept with the technology and then uh, pay for the lesson with a lot of money, a lot of my time. And uh, it didn't work before because without the technology, you have securitization, a heavy regulation, and no trading liquidity. Now with the tokenization, all of a sudden it makes perfect sense for we co own. So in 2017, at the peak of ICO, I jump in the, uh, I hop on the bandwagon, you know, trying to get involved in it. Lo and behold, I learned so much about cryptocurrency, learned so much about the ICO, blah, 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 blockchain. Then um, during that time, if you go to a cocktail party, what do people talk about? They talk about, hey, did you buy Bitcoin today? You know, and uh, how is your Ether doing? They're trading cryptocurrency, you know, and that creates a lot of newly rich for a lot of young kids. You know, people who never the uh, experience what business world is like, but you know, it's just unbelievable during that time. Anybody who would touch upon put the money into cryptocurrency, you make a lot of money so easily. They think they are better than Warren Buffett, you know? A lot of 25-year-old kids, they own $5 million home in Santa Monica. It's just crazy during that time. So I sort of got the inspiration. I want to pick up where I left off for the Week Home project. Then in the Christmas party in 2017, so I went to the Christmas party in my office building. I met a, a young person. He's a very, you know, energetic and uh, person who owns a moving company. So of course, in the party we talked about trading cryptocurrency. Then uh, I say, "Oh, I bought uh, you know three hundred dollar worth of Ether today." Blah blah blah. <laughs> so I explained to him, "Do you understand the technology be behind the cryptocurrency?" You know, as I explained to you before, decentralized distributed ledger technology, decentralized database that makes the cryptocurrency possible. Then uh, during the cocktail party, I say, "What do you do?" Then he told me he's um, in the logistic, you know, moving company for helping helping people to move. I spent the whole evening explaining to him, blockchain too can disrupt your industry. Blockchain is disrupting every single industry. That night when I drove home, after speaking to him the whole evening, that whole idea of applying this, you know, sharing economy concept, but young just property and assets co-ownership into services, you know, get stuck in my head. For the next two years, I've been traveling around the world, telling the story, created the whole concept of mu chain. And uh, basically what it is, let me explain to you. I feel so passionate about it. I dropped everything I was doing on the WeCo own, on the co-ownership, because I feel if I make another successful venture on the FinTech, probably the on, only about less than one or 2% of the world's population I can benefit. But if I can make the mu chain project, successful i can really reach out to more than 90 percent of the world's population i'll explain to you why and this turbo chain i'll leave this topic later on which is not as uh, important so after doing you know over the new year in 2018 so i spent a lot of time trying to create a new name for the new venture we decided on the using the mule concept mules are hardy animal you know they can carry 300 pounds versus a horse can only carry 150 pounds. So now, what is the mu chain? Let's say you are based in Riyadh, okay? The, you are a member of the mu chain platform. So you post the, you know, your travel itinerary, 
and uh, you're going to go to London next week. Now, all of a sudden, you post your trip itinerary there, somebody going to approach you, you know, P2P. They say, well, you know, the my daughter studying the university in London. Can you bring the jacket to her? If you do, I'll pay you 100 bucks. Now, chances are your airline tickets only cost about $500, $500 right? So 20% of your trip costs is financed by simply doing a favor. You don't even have to do extra work for anybody. Basically, what we're doing here is turning every traveler around the world to be able to make money for themselves as their own boss, as long as you travel. So from a cross-border traveling to an intercity, to an intracity local meal delivery, there's three parts. We want to focus on creating a generic platform, generic app for anybody who are on the move, you can make money for yourself. You're moving from the west side of town to the east side of town tomorrow. Somebody happened to, you know, want somebody to bring something over there. You know, for example, there's a lot of extreme situation as well. So again, on the website for Mew Chain, you will see one of my video and talking about, I really encourage you to watch this video to understand this whole concept on the Mew Chain platform and this video here. So basically, that's the first step to make everybody on, on the move to be able to make money for themselves. The second concept came in April. Then we created a, a concept called Pack Station. What if this person doesn't want to meet you in person because meeting people online could be very dangerous? So he can actually the, turn on his mobile phone, look at the map on the MailChain app. Then all of a sudden he see all these Pack Station owners right around him on the Google map. What is the Pack Station owner? It's basically anybody sitting at home. You can let somebody drop an item. You take care of it overnight. Just live at the corner of your apartment. Next day, somebody else come to pick it up. You make $10. Why not? So this is the second most significant concept. First of all, we make everybody on the move to be able to make money for themselves, be their own boss. Secondly, we make everybody staying at home doing nothing to be able to monetize all your idle time sitting at home. Think about the significance. This is not talking about only wealthy people of a weak own project. You have to have money to own something. Now we're talking about the whole world population. That's why beyond 1%, we're going to 90% of the whole world. Think about the whole, you know, Africa, South America, whatever, you know, in the Southeast Asia, all the emerging market. Anybody can create new jobs, make money for themselves for the first time. And you don't need to have any knowledge, education. All you need to have is just business ethics and don't break the law. That's all. All of a sudden, we get to create jobs all over the world. So again, on the mutual platform, you got the requester who have any the, the demand to send a, the a jacket or anything. You know, then you got the a mule pal. We stop calling a mule because of the sensitivity. <laughs> we call a mule pal. You are the pal of the mule. That's the person who travels. Pack station owner could be anybody. Think about it, the pack station is even more significant than the mule pal. Why? Because, you know, there's so much, such a big population in the world of senior citizen, of handicapped people. They cannot go out, attend a conference, go out to get a job. But previously, they can only become a burden of the society sitting at home asking for government's charity money. All of a sudden, you can use your spare time. Let's say your grandparents, you know, you have all the time to kill every day. Why don't you act as a pack station owner? You don't have to take any item. You can say, I only take the, the, the light item, like a jacket under two pounds or whatever, you know? Then you make some additional money. With that additional money, you can buy some toy candies for your grandchildren, you know? So this is the significance of it. And then um, because of the, this egalitarian aspect of it, I sort of devoted a lot of my time in 2018, 2019, and spoke in a lot of conferences all over the world. And all those, you know, information is on the MewChain.com website. Now, if you take a look at it, why is that MuChain technology company? It's a MuChain blockchain 
based on blockchain. Why is that different from a traditional tech venture? Because any tech venture, let's say you create a new product, a new service, you want to sell to somebody. Any business, you want somebody's money from his pocket. But what does MuChain sell? You sell job opportunities. Anybody can, instead of paying for your services, you get to make money by being a new pal, a traveler. Then you can make money by singly, simply staying home. So that's the significance. And that's made possible by blockchain. Why? Because remember what internet did to the whole world? That's basically, you have all the website all over the world. That's a knowledge equalization. What blockchain, the decentralized database concept made possible is to make the next step, the business transaction possible to equalize the price among of the same item around the world. Let me give you a good example. Let's say in the iPhone, you know, in the US, you could sell for $1,000, but in Moscow or in a different country, it could be selling for $1,500. It's a premium, okay? Or $2,000. So previously with internet alone, you can only see on the website knowledge equalization. You understand, oh, that's cheaper over there, but it's so expensive here. What can I do? Nothing. Now with new chain based on the blockchain opportunity, we can make that business transaction possible. Why don't you just go to the website and then order that, that iPhone and to be delivered in the US to a pack station owner? Then you engage another mule pal to pick up some pack station owner, bring it back to Moscow, and then drop it to you or drop it in another pack station in Moscow. You go there to pick it up. The pack station owner could be anybody. It doesn't have to be a commercial outlet. It could be any apartment owner just two floors above you, right? So we make everybody to become a pack station owner. You know, you yourself, your friends, your family, your parents, anybody, whenever you want. You don't have to be a dedicated worker. This is a gig economy. Whenever you're not traveling, you're traveling, you make money as a mill pal. When you're not traveling, you switch on your status as a pack station owner. There's more about this concept, and uh, I understand we don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but I want you to walk away with the concept and uh, that's introduced, innovative concept introduced by this technology, which wasn't available before. So everybody talking about sharing economy, but what is the additional advantage that Mu Chin project bring to the table? That's something called a convenience assistance service. Because you're going to travel from Ria to London anyway. You're not making a special trip to make that $100. If a sender, requester, send it through FedEx or UPS, FedEx and UPS have to increase their capacity, hire another plane, burn more fossil fuel. But in our human society, there's so many inefficient use of our time and activity. What Mu Chain is trying to capitalize on is to take that inefficiency away. Because you're going to go to London anyway. You're not burning any additional fossil fuel. You can get to, together we can get to save the world, save the earth. So that's one of the most important, you know, convenient assistance service concept. A few words about how we plan to operate this business. And because we want to be the genuine, really P2P business, and everybody benefits. So that's kind of egalitarian, right? Anybody can make money with no boss. And um, then we created a concept called the ranch operator. In different parts of the city, you basically own the business. We, all you have to do just to be, you know, internet, social media savvy, good at marketing, you run that business in every city. You know, every city could be, you know, hundreds, thousands of range operator, anybody working for themselves. And because of the technology, decentralized. So let's say um, the um, MuPal, you do a job, you pay the platform 5% of your fee. You make $100, right? $5 go to the, the platform. A pack station owner make $10, you make 50 cents to the platform. But if you are the geographically located in that city, your range operator, 51% of all the revenue belong to you. So that's a whole scheme we're trying to deploy this project. 
After two years, we developed the whole platform and the app. Right in the beginning of this year, and uh, we're trying to launch the business to do the marketing. Then came the pandemic. All of a sudden, there's no trafficking, no tra no traveling anymore. <laughs> so right now, the project is on hold. We're waiting for the pandemic, you know, ease off. And uh, as I said, there's three parts of the cross border. That's our bread and butter. Intercity between LA and San Fran, uh, between Riyadh and, and Jeddah, you know. Then Wishing City, the intro city. So as a result of the pandemic, that local delivery, meal delivery, grocery delivery, just on fire. But that's not a business any new startup venture can get into because there's no profit. Those are all, you know, and being shoveled money by the VCs, you know. They, none of them is making business. They're trying to get you. It's already too late. Unfortunately, the VC got involved to that stage. So everybody trying to grab market share. You know, you look at all the leading the uh, player and uh, Uber lost money, normal passenger. Uber Eats is still OK. Then you got Grubhub, you got Postmates in the US, you know, in the China, they just on fire, Mei Tuan and Ulama, Alibaba, you know, all this company. So they're only focused on the part three. But again, that's not for a startup company to get into it unless you have a lot of money and uh, shovel to your nose by the VCs. So what we are focusing on still zeroing the part one business and waiting for the pandemic to ease off to pick up where we left off. So that's why in the beginning of the year, and we put the mule chain temporarily on hold and we pick up where we left off in 2017 on the we call own project. That's where the three technology company and nowadays, and uh, as you can see, since the blockchain has provided so many additional advantage that wasn't possible before, and uh, we're trying to exploit it to the extreme that we can do. But one last word of caution, a lot of people getting involved in blockchain, they focus on the cryptocurrency part of it. So there could be a lot of currency speculation punting. That doesn't represent the entire world of blockchain. Blockchain has a lot of uh, healthy, wholesome, you know, I don't want to prejudice the other side and uh, application for corporate, for the government, for the human society. So I know I'm running out of time. I will leave 10 minutes, nine minutes, you know, for Q&A. And uh, if you need any more information, um, feel free to contact me and then we can carry on the conversation in a deeper level.